Hello everyone and welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games and today we're going to continue on with our basic tutorial for Gary Grigsby's War in the East 2. Now this is part number four and in this part we will be looking at unit counter info and all of the different information that you can get from in unit info cards. But before we do that, as people that have uh, been around the channel for a while know, I like to go back and correct something if it was wrong or I misstated it. Hey, I do this without a script, and so sometimes uh, I don't always get it exactly how it's supposed to be. So I like to back up and make sure you have the proper information. And it was brought to my attention earlier in game options when we talked about enhanced player TB control that I had said I wanted that, but I had not clicked on it. And so just to make sure there's no, you know, I guess uh, confusion there, you do need to click on that if you are going to get that theater box control enhanced. Now I'll just keep it off here for now because we are gonna jump back into the game that I'm playing on the channel, which is Let's Play 12 as the save here and we'll pop that up. Now last time we were talking about counters and hexes and we went around and we I think we were looking at this division here which is the 57th infantry division which is part of 55th corps. Um, and so we had looked at this and just kind of generally talked about this. One thing I wanted to point out before we moved off of hexes is that, and let's click off that unit, so we've just got the kind of general display here. One thing I wanted to point out is any hex here, you'll have the pop-up. You can also right-click on this hex and you get more options. And so it'll tell you where it's located on the map. It will tell you the ground weather you can tell it to build a new airfield and of course we're not there yet in the tutorial but we'll get there you can say build fortified unit again you can hit center map so it centers right on that hex uh, you can go to map info and what is shown here on the map and so we've talked about map info up here of course uh, where you have all the different buttons but let's just say you're out on the map at this hex you can do that from here as well. And so we can show fort levels, rail damage, logistics info, all of these things uh, through a right click, this menu screen appears. We also have the info screens. And so info screens up in the top left in the tab here, you can also access them from here if you would like to. So you can go directly, let's say out here to the commander's report uh, or reinforcements and transfers, I guess that's what I clicked upon. But you can do that from a right click. Now that maybe would become more important as we move back, let's say to what, Krakow? Is that where we are? Let me see. Uh, we are indeed at Krakow. Let's right click Krakow and you'll see here, set as your reserve theater box arrival hex. Well, I think you can kind of figure out what that means uh, as you get uh, reinforcements or new units that come on the map. You could set them to arrive at Krakow if you wanted to. You can also go down here. Uh, you can look at the city if you would like. You can look at the air base and what the supply priority is. You can say, hey, uh, let's bring in an air operational group to the airfield here. Uh, that's from our reserve. Now, we haven't gotten into the air yet, but that seems like something that would be nice. Uh, bring air groups themselves, so not just the command, but just uh, the plane, an air group, you know, the squadron, the Gruppe, as they call it in German. Uh, you can look at the railroad, railroad depot. Well, I say you can look at it. You can set the priority or disband it from here. Center the map, map info, info screen. So I just wanted to show you that, that you can actually right click on a hex and get a lot of information about that hex. All right. So let's go back out here to 57th Infantry Division. Now we had started down the unit counter that you see over here kind of in the box uh, that gives you general information about that unit. Of course, if you click on a hex that has two units, it will show you for both units. We'll go back to this one though. 
we had talked a little bit about ready, refit, reserve, ready. We'll talk more about that when we get into ground combat. The basic idea is that 95% of the time, let's say you're going to have these on ready. If you want them to get priority on reinforcements and upgrades, they will be in refit. And if you want them to rest and sit back behind the line a little bit, you would put them on reserve, but it's actually very powerful because they can still be committed to battle. So they can really uh, they can really operate as a true tactical reserve where if you're on the attack or on the offense, they can be committed to battles within three hexes of where they sit at the time. And if you're on defense and it's very powerful for the Soviets, they can be committed to battles based on your generals and whether your generals think it's a good idea within six hexes of a battle. So if you were firing a battle here, let's say, in a town, I'm not gonna try, no, it's Rosiche. Sure it is. Uh, if you were fighting a battle here on the defensive, a unit in reserve that's one, two, three, four, five, six units all the way, or six hexes all the way up here could be committed to that battle. And so if you do like to play the Soviet side, that can be, become a very powerful defensive force. Uh, but most of the time, these units are going to be on ready. Now then, uh, combat combat prep points. This is a new concept. Uh, it really, what it is, is trying to alleviate the chances that you march 80 kilometers and then a launch an attack and that you would possibly be at the same strength. The way War in the East 1 worked, no matter how far you went, as long as you had movement points left, your unit, it may degrade a little bit, uh, but not that much. Now this combat prep points comes in here and it really uh, chips away at your combat's ability to fight the further it's moved in a turn. And let's uh, click on this unit and let's say that we wanted to move out here. Now I have this selection on that shows you how many movement points you would have left when you get to a certain location. And we have movement fog, fog of war on, so we can't get beyond the light pink. We could come here, okay, and let's just do that. We right click to move up there. Now that we're here, we could move on to further hexes. That's kind of how movement fog of war works. But what, what I really wanted to show you is if you look, when we go into this hex, it will show us how many movement points we have left if we move there, five. But it also shows you you're losing combat prep points and it's causing fatigue. And that's what you see right here. It's a teardrop, which I guess is interesting. They decided to make that a teardrop. That is your fatigue level. And over here, that goes from zero to 100. Of course, your units will not be as effective the more fatigue they have, and they will not be as effective the fewer the combat prep points they have. So let's go back to a unit back here that hasn't moved yet, and you can see that's got 100 combat prep points and it's got zero fatigue. And so what the developers and the designers of this game have tried to do is model a little better your combat effectiveness after you've moved a long ways or after you've moved through difficult terrain or after you've moved through uh, Soviet hexes. It's trying to model that by decreasing your combat prep points and increasing your fatigue as you move through them and it makes the unit less effective in battle. And the thing is, these carry over from turn to turn. Now, it used to be as the Germans, as the Axis, you would try to advance as far as you possibly could every turn. Now, you would lose some combat value as you went out you know, further and further, but it wasn't that big of a penalty. You almost kind of just forgot about it and said, let's go as far as we can. Well, now you have some considerations to make. Uh, you know, if this gets down to, let's say, zero this time 
when we move it. So let's move it all the way out here. And let's see how these click down once it gets there. And you can always hit the space bar to give it, get it where you want it to go. Now we're down to 74 combat prep points and we're up to 49 fatigue. This unit is not gonna be as effective fighting this turn, but it also may not be as effective fighting next turn because you only add back so much combat prep points and you only reduce so much fatigue during the logistics phase, which will be before we move again next time. And so they're giving you another consideration when it comes to how far you move, where you're moving these things to and through. I like it, I like it. It makes it a little more you know, of a thought experiment of how far you should go. Now, right below that, we have how much supply, meaning essentially food, but it's really an abstraction of all of supply, buttons on your uniform, shoes, you name it. But supply, really think of that as food. You see this as a percentage of what this unit needs or is requesting per turn. Below that is fuel, and right below that is <clears throat> ammunition. And of course, you know, you can't fight without ammunition, uh, but those are the three kind of overall, when I say supply in general, I'm talking about all three of them. Your supply is really quote unquote, your supply, your, fu your fuel and your bullets, or what I call it, food, fuel, and bullets. So the foods on top, fuel, bullets. And we'll get a little deeper into that as we go into logistics. Now, what is this line right here? There's two different kinds of movement in this game. There is marching somewhere, and then there's what we call strategic movement. And strategic movement could either be any of these three things right here. It could be moving by rail, and we can pick on that if we want, or what is called naval transport or amphibious transport right here. Um, rail, I think, is kind of explanatory. You get it. Uh, railways, we can travel down railways that we control. So if we pick on this unit and we're in railroad movement phase, we can go anywhere that it shows us here that's lit up down these railways. And it's a very quick way to move your units around. And you may say, well, why don't we always move by rail? Well, because these railways can only take so much freight, whether that freight be supply, the big overall general supply, or troops. And so if you move something down this railway, it's gonna take less food, fuel, and bullets down this railway. So you gotta be a little careful which railways you use. Okay, so you may say, what does that have to do what we're, with what we were just talking about? Well, this talks about your overall movement for a turn, and it includes strategic movement. So let's just say we move this Panzer Division here by rail. And as you'll see, as we get down here, the overall movement score is down to 94. Okay, now then, let's say we wanna take it off the train. So we put it on a train, it's loaded. Let's say we wanna take it off the train and it says 100 strategic movement points to take it off the train. That's what this is, strategic movement. And so let's back this up and say we didn't go that far. We only went this far by train. And as you'll see, the icons now on the train Let's say that we want to get off the train. We have 100 strategic movement points left. We have 24 overall or non-strategic movement points left. Let's take it off the train. We did that. It moved our overall movement to zero because it cost 100 points. That also removes our regular movement points. So they work together, they're dynamic, in that you have 200 kind of overall movement points. All right, let's back this up again and think about it again. And let's this time, let's have it march here to this hex. All right, so it gets over to this hex. It's got 
36 regular marching or movement. In this case, it's a mobile division. It's got 36 overall movement points, okay? Um, or, I'm sorry, it's got 36 overland or regular movement points. It's got 146 overall, but this really is dynamic with whether you're putting things on rail or not. And so let's go back to the rail here. And now we've got it on the rail down here. There we go. We've got it on the rail. And now it says, okay, well, we can go at 146. Let's go to there and down it goes. Now we've got 58 overall movement points and we're down to 14 of them being normal movement or off rail or non-strategic movement. So they're dynamic. When you move something on a train, it also erodes its overall on land movement costs and just always keep that in mind and so you can go as far as this strategic movement points allow but keep in mind that's also eroding how far something motorized or infantry can march all right uh, and if we try to take this off the train we can't do it so you don't have to click on this to put it on the train but you do have to click on this to take it off the train all right uh, the same works for naval transport mode. Naval transport mode is for moving from port to port. And so they have to be friendly controlled ports. And so let's go to the north here. We now control this port and we control these ports. So if we put a unit here, we could click on this button. It would automatically show up out here with a little naval symbol on it and we could move it to this port that's naval transport amphibious what is amphibious well let's go south to where you may actually use this and that would be out of let's say odessa once we take the port of odessa you could uh, turn something to amphibious mode it would move out from the port of odessa and have a little amphibious symbol on it and we could bring it over here and drop it on this hex, all right? And we're not there yet in this game, uh, and so it's hard to show you a really good example of that, but the basic idea is Amphibious goes from friendly controlled port, so right now, this port, to a land unit that could be friendly or unfriendly controlled. Naval transport goes from friendly port to friendly port so we could have these you know we could have a unit move from here to here by naval transport all right now then the next three are very easy it's how many men how many guns essentially artillery so big guns right uh the big they can be stationary they can be mobile but they're guns they're artillery how many of those you have and how many armored fighting vehicles now that could be tanks it could be armored cars uh, anything that's an armored fighting vehicle an afv is listed here and so 9th panzer division has 15,676 men 139 guns and 147 afvs now let's go back out to uh 6th army We'll just go to this, the 168th ID, they, or infantry division, they are commanded by 50, the 55th Corps here. They're within one of five. So the maximum is five to be within command, but it's only one away from its headquarters. As you can see here, one hex away. It's got 10 attack value, combat value. It's got 14 movement points which include 200 strategic points. So we can move that by rail. Uh, now that is gonna chip away at our march movement costs here, or march movement points, uh, but we do have all of that strategic movement ready. Uh, it's in ready mode. It's only got four combat prep points, all right, because we moved it quite a bit last time and it just didn't rebuild many of those. It's now got 20 fatigue, which it worked off from last last time. It was higher when the turn, the logistics phase went. You know, it does reduce some of that, but not all of it in this case. 
uh, and that will all be dependent on whether it is next to Soviet units, Soviet hexes, what kind of terrain it's in, how close it is to its headquarters, uh, all of those kind of factors. It's got 123% of the food or supply, oh, you know, the, the more specific supply that it needs, 135 fuel and 128% ammunition. As I said, it's got all of its strategic movement uh, points left. It's got a little over 16,000 men, 173 guns, and zero armored fighting vehicles. Now let's say we right click on that. That brings up the unit card for the 168th Infantry Division. And what is this W? You can click on that. That is the Wikipedia. And so you can go in here and read all about the 168th Infantry Division historically, if you want to. It's part of the 6th Army. These are hyperlinked, so you can go on further into uh, the information about this division. It shows you the icon of the division, and that's what W is. It once again shows you the men, the guns, the AFVs. It shows you its one loss record here so it's fought in three battles it's won all three and that helps the general uh the core general that commands it that core general gets um credit for those victories can and can actually gain attributes as these divisions out here do better here you see a picture of the counter it's identical to this over here so same idea it's ready combat prep points, fatigue, you see the icon again. Then we get down into, and I call this the baseball card. It's the stats, so American baseball, right? This is the stats of the unit, and that's what you get when you right-click on the unit card over here. You get the full back of the card, and this will tell you the combat uh, value offensively and defensively. You can click on this, but we're not going to do that quite yet. We'll get right back to that in a second. Uh, combat value on offense is a 10.59. On defense, it's a 10.18. Okay. As you can see, it always rounds down. And so it's showing our combat value as a 10, even though the offensive value is a 10.59. Then we get into the table of equipment. And it's showing you 81 of 90. Now, what is the table of equipment? What is it showing you? Can you manipulate that at all? All of that is a yes. You can change it and you can change uh, the values of this. But let's look at the table of equipment, okay? This right now is the ideal setup for what they call a 41 7th wave infantry division which is what the 168th id is to the game all right so this is its default setup to the game and you can see here the way it's supposed to be set up or what it's supposed to have are 324 rifle squads 36 engineer squads 12 bicycles hey let's get out and you know cycle about uh, it's got nine cavalry squads. Again, this is the default or what it should be, the ideal of this uh, unit. Uh, 90 infantry, anti-tank guns, 110 machine guns, so on and so forth. What is this over here? This is actually what it has at this point. And so you can see it's actually got 14 bicycle squads, the ideal 41st 7th wave infantry division would have 12 and so it's got 14 it's got a couple of extra and it shows you that 116 percent here you'll see um 291 rifle squads ideally would have 324 so it's running at 89 percent of its table of equipment its ideal setup and so on and so forth you can look through all of these if you want for each unit um, and you can say, okay, you know, I'm supposed to have 110 machine guns. I've only got 100, 90%. What can I do about that? Fine. All right, we'll get to that in one second. Let's go down here. 
it shows you the ideal infantry division, how many men it should have, how many men this actually does have, all right? Here, it shows you what the next upgrade will be. And so the table of equipment for these infantry divisions, the ideal uh, table of equipment, will update. And so as we go on, now it's showing you this is the current table of equipment that's ideal. This is what it's going to change to. So in 42, when it goes to 42 infantry division in December of 1941, the 42 infantry divisions had more rifle squads by 12. Uh, they had less, well, let's see, uh, they have 36 pioneer squads. So this is shown a little bit differently. Uh, the 41st 7th wave ideally had nine cavalry squads by 42. That was 18. Uh, it's got a little bit different stuff. The 81 millimeter uh, mortar. Do we see that here? We don't see that at all. And so these infantry divisions upgrade in December of 1941 to this table of equipment. And the game will try to make those infantry divisions become this, essentially. Okay? Um, let's go back to where we were. But this is how it is now. The game is trying to get this division to be this. This is what it actually is. Now, show ground element mapping is very interesting. Uh, this will go into a little more detail for some of these things. Um, and you can kind of just drill down a little bit. And, and, you know, it just shows you a nice representation. Uh, if a rifle squad, there were different types of rifle squads here for the 40 or what was supposed to be in the table of equipment, it will show you that. So it just kind of drills down one level. This isn't the best example because nothing's really changed. But when you, when you get in later into December of 41 and it's trying to upgrade, it may show you that it's still got some rifle squad 40s, but now it's got some rifle squad 41s as well. This is where you would come to look for that. Okay, so that's the table of equipment. Now, there is not a whole lot you can do about that. Those are pre-existing templates. They're historically based, okay? Now, what does this 81 of 90 mean? This 90 means that compared to the other infantry divisions in the game, its table of equipment's actually a little less just by default because it's that seventh wave infantry. So it's got a little less strength than some of the other infantry division templates, all right? There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, and this is just giving you information saying it's 81% of the template. That's what you currently have. Now then, what's max TOE? This, is, this allows you to set different units, their table of equipment levels. And this gives you really nice control over how much the game is going to try to restock or bring it up to the maximum TOE level, okay? So let's say we put this on 80, right? It's going to look at what the ideal is, and it's only going to try to do 80% of that when it restocks this for reinforcement and, and upgrade purposes, all right? So you have two different controls. You've got... I'm going to give you priority over other units when you're on refit to get uh, re, uh, reinforcements and upgrades. So you can do it here. You know, this is one mechanic of it. You can also over here, if you have units that are in the back, they're not as important. They're not fighting on a front of the war that's as, um, you know, active, let's say. And you say, I don't want this the game to try to completely re, restock uh you know replace give it replacements or upgrade it as much as i want it to do other units well you can co you can go then and set the toe level to a lower level and we will be doing that for instance if we take leningrad in the north in my let's play then all of the units in the north don't need those replacements as much as units in the center or the south will that are still fighting, okay? 
Now then, so we've talked about the TOE. They also show what the actual elements that you have right now, which we can also see here, remember, this should match up with this, which is the elements tab. It shows you everything that is in this division. It shows you their experience, how many are ready to fight immediately, how many are damaged, and they've been taken out of the ready status, meaning they would not fight if we got into a battle right now. They go back and they're, they go into a pool called the damage pool, and they will try to return to this unit, all other things being equal, but they just may go into the reinforcements pool. Okay, so this tells you how many are damaged, what they are, and how much fatigue they have on a level of zero to 100. Okay, and so that's what you see over here. That all goes into table of equipment and max table of equipment. Well, I guess this really is the table of equipment. We could lower this if we don't want it to completely try to restock or reinforce this unit itself. Then we get into what is your higher headquarters, the HHQ. This is your direct headquarters for this unit. In this case, it's the 55th Corps. That is the core headquarters for this unit. The OHQ is one level. Well, it's the ultimate command for this on the Southern Front, which is Army Group South. So LV Corps, 55th Corps, I do know my Roman numerals. The 55th Corps actually reports to the 6th Army. That's why this is purple. It's in the 6th Army. But ultimately, this is its real command, Army Group South. Now, Army Group South does report up to OKH, but this OHQ doesn't go to that level. It just says, what's your real ultimate command? And that's Army Group South. Morale. Now, morale is very interesting because most German units start the game with a 75 or an 80 for morale soviet forces start much lower at like 40 or 50 okay and so this tells you what's the base level of morale for this unit and in this case it's 75 which is very good uh, morale is the most important combat element in the game you really need to you know make sure your units are in good morale you got to give them rest to build up morale but also you may say well why is this 79 well, because the base is 75, but it's won a few battles, its morale is up. It's in good supply, it's won some battles, and so it's like, hey, we're feeling good, right? And so it's a little bit above the base level. Now, through the mechanics of the game, it's always trying to get down or up to this base level. So if it loses some battles and gets down to, let's say, 65% morale, every turn it naturally tries to get up to its base morale or down to its base morale. But, you know, as you keep doing better, this may be at 90. You know, if you keep them in good supply, they're winning battles, that morale can go up. But naturally, it's going to get chipped away a little bit because the game tries to get it to this. And these base morale levels can also be affected by the difficulty level that you select. So if you selected impossible, I think the, the typical German infantry division, the base level is like 60. Uh, but normally, we're on normal for this game. It's 75. I will tell you this, the SS units naturally have a morale level that's even higher. They're considered kind of more fanatical troops. They, they're true believers uh, for the most part. And so they can have morales like 80, 85, or 90 as their base level. Uh, the nation, you get that. It's Germany. Supply need, fuel need, ammo need, support need. This is how much they actually have. This is how much they need. That's where these percentages come from, all right? Construction value. Now that goes to fort level that we've talked about before. Uh, essentially, this is how quickly they can build fortifications in a hex 
when they're sitting in a hex. And so if this sits here next time, what is the fort level right now in this hex? Let's go see, might be zero. We might not see anything. Uh, yeah, I believe it is. There is no fort level here, but if they sit here for a turn, that will go up and that's based on their construction value. Now the old rules used to be that essentially you needed 50 in construction value to build a fort level one level higher. So that would go up in this hex to a fort level one by next turn because it's over 50. I must admit, I have not read what if that's changed. I doubt that it has. It was a very good system and it made sense. Uh, I will confirm that before next episode. But just, I think in general, think of this. If it's over 50, it will build a fort level of at least one before the next turn. Transport cost, this is how much uh, it costs to move down rail. Uh, and you can see here that goes into strategic movement points and how much rail capacity these units are taking up if you move them by rail. I think this is rail and naval. Uh, vehicles and need, it's got 395 trucks. Right now it's needed 299 just to carry its basic supply around and maybe some of these bigger things like AT guns or whatever. Um, and so it's telling you this unit has 395 vehicles. It needs 299. They're really trucks. Okay. Non-motorized. Now this becomes important if you wanted to attach something to a motorized core uh, or you, when it comes to support units, if you want to put them in a motorized uh, division or a motorized core, for these purposes, it's infantry, it's non-motorized. We'll get to support units in the future. And supply status, it's in supply, okay? Now there's more on this card, like supply details that you can get into. We'll cover that in logistics. Uh, merge unit, merge unit. Well, we can't really merge a unit because it's not been broken up before. So there's nothing to merge. Uh, motorized unit, you can pay admin points to motorize an infantry unit if you want to. Uh, it's not something I generally or typically do, and I can't claim to be an expert to do it, but you or how to do it, other than you can hit this button and motorize it if you want to. And it says checking on required vehicles for motorization. And this is the cost, three admin points, and 1,320 trucks. Now the game will take those trucks away from other units. So that's your cost, 1,320 trucks, three AP, and then we can move this at the usual motorized rate, which they can move much faster. Uh, you could also disband this unit if you wanted to do that for some reason. I can't imagine, I'm, I'm trying to think of a reason why you'd wanna do that. I can't really think of a good one. Um, now down here, we already talked about this. This shows you, you your actual table of equipment at this moment, experience, how many are ready, how many are damaged, what kind of equipment it is, and their fatigue level. And then you have a assigned, and assigned goes to support units. And so units that are smaller than divisions, you can attach up to three of those to an individual div division. So if we click on that, you can see all of your possible choices from anti-aircraft battalions to anti-tank battalions, uh, infantry, motorized infantry battalions. Uh, you even have armor battalions. If we go down here, you've got artillery and engineers and machine guns. You can attach up to three of those to a unit. Now I can tell you typically I do not attach those support units directly to infantry divisions. I will attach anti-aircraft to panzer or motorized divisions because usually they'll get way out far in front of your army 
and I like to give them some anti-aircraft support. But when it comes to infantry divisions, I like to do this directly from the core headquarters level. And when we get into support units, we'll talk much more about that. But this time, I'm going to call it an episode. We've talked about the unit info cards and everything that they can tell you. When we come back next time, I've got a treat because we're going to get into the air war and we're going to start off talking about how you organize your air and the three different ways that you can do it computer controlled completely computer controlled with your input or all of it you doing it manually but that's all for next time this has been episode number four of the basic tutorial for gary grigsby's warn these two this is strategy gaming dojo I'll talk to you guys next time. Thanks for stopping by.